Okay. I think before before we start on the on this last section, we've got some uh, some questions from the online folks. So let me just try to tackle those. Some of them were a little. Can you close that? Uh, okay, a uh, couple of questions. Oh, you're way over here now. Yeah, I am. Where are you? We're trying to figure out where you are. Hello. Okay, uh, first um, thing is just a um, shout out. Real enjoying the information. Keep up the good work. Please bring your seminar to Houston. Uh, one is we can you hit the ketogenic phase for insulin resistant people again? But we're waiting to hear back if you can elaborate on that question a little bit more. For yes, yeah, so, so what I mentioned is that when you are on a ketogenic diet, uh, the muscle tissue, or organs, and various other tissues are going to become insulin resistant in order to spare glucose for the brain, which absolutely needs it. Uh, so they are going to be forced to run off of ketone bodies and fat for fuel. So the insulin resistance that results from a ketogenic state is not pathogenic in the same way that the insulin resistance that results from carbohydrate overconsumption. Okay, uh, this is a, a question. Good God, man, what could you possibly be eating to equal 7,000 or was it 5,000 calories in two meals? Do tell. Basically, what are you, what's your diet looking like nowadays? I heard you mention you ordered a half pound of bacon. Yeah, so... I, I do a compressed eating window type deal, and uh, I'm part of a CSA. I get about 20 pounds of grass-fed and pasture meat per month, and uh, essentially my meat looks like, like at least like half a pound or a pound, like a huge chunk of meat with all of the fat that renders from it onto a pile of greens, uh, and, and I eat like, like that twice a day, and then I'll supplement that probably with like a little bit of a, you know, coconut flakes or maybe some avocado or whatnot. Sometimes I'll just drink coconut milk out of the can. Um, it's, a, it's pretty easy to get like a crap ton of calories, and especially with the fat uh, in, a, in a couple of meals. You just have to be careful with the steateria. You know, it's, it's, it's like the price to pay to do that, I guess. Okay, um, and Paul and Karen, if you're listening online, check your email. We asked for some more information back. Just to, to elaborate, I um, sometimes, uh, so during the week, I don't eat breakfast, I'll eat lunch and dinner, and those are like meat, veggies, a lot of fat. Post-workout, I will have like some sweet potatoes and, and whatnot in the mix. And then during uh, the weekend, what I like to do is have breakfast, no lunch, and dinner and breakfast like on Saturdays I'll typically do like one pound of sausage and four duck eggs and duck eggs are like twice the size of chicken eggs and they've got a lot of muscle tone to them and they're excellent so I'll have that with a little bit of berries and I won't be hungry for like 12 hours and then I'll eat 12 hours later and then on the Sunday I like to have like one pound of bacon with four duck eggs and, and again you know some berries the, the weekends are the only time when I'll eat some fruit uh, and I, yeah I have no problem with that Okay, final question from Drew. Uh, assuming sleep and diet are in order, would four short Metcons on top of four heavy lifting days per week be too much um, met conditioning during a mass gain phase? Per week, that sounds pretty legit. I uh, personally do like a max effort black box template. Uh, I would say it depends on the duration of those Metcons. I would keep them really, really short, like below 10 minutes, ideally around five minutes. But uh, four, four times per week, I think, is, uh, is pretty legit. I mean, I do a three-on-one-off uh, type of template where day one is just a power lift and then a really short, uh, typical CrossFit couplet, something like Fran. Day two will be an Olympic lift and then gymnastic stuff. I go to the Gymnastic Bodies website by Coach Somers and I'll, I'll do whatever I can off of that. Some of the stuff is just way out of my league. Then day three will be probably like a press or something like that, some other powerlifting movement with monostructural Metcon. So either sprinting on, on uh, running or the rower or uh, even maybe some box jumps or some uh, double unders, you know, like 300 double unders for time or stuff like that. That's the way I like to roll three on one off. That works really fine for me. Uh, the, the, yeah, I guess. Final question is, is uh, guys looking for guidance on how many grams of sweet potatoes post-workout? I just don't weigh and measure. I hate it. 
I, I, I'm a chemist. Every reaction that I run, like everything that I do involves weighing stuff and measuring the properties. And if I start doing that with my food, I'm going to go insane. So I just don't weigh and measure it. I just have this, you know, I eat until I'm full and then I, I call it a day. If I were to estimate, I don't, I don't, I really don't know. I don't know. I just they eat until you're full. And when, when it comes to the stuff that's mostly starch, I don't worry too much about overdoing it, especially not uh, post-workout. So, yeah, sorry, I can't give you like a precise number on that. Okay. So traditionally fermented foods, if you look at various cultures, you know, we're told that, oh, these people ate a lot of soy, these people ate a lot of legumes, these people eat a lot of that, that stuff is healthy and you should eat it. But when you do a little bit of digging, you find that a lot of the food is actually fermented. So when it comes to soy-based products, uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce that because I'm, I'm sure I'll, I'll totally butcher it, but you have like miso, natto, soy sauce, which are all fermented soy-based stuff. Tofu itself is not fermented, but stinky to tofu is a dish that's made by the Chinese, which is fermented. And then you have tempeh, which is Indonesian and is also fermented, like there's soy cakes that are fermented. Then you go into the milk-based products, and of course you have cheese, which everybody's familiar with, kefir, kumis, shubat, which is uh, fermented camel's milk. I'm not sure how to pronounce that, filmiolk maybe. Creme fraiche, which is a French, uh, French soured cream. Smetana, yogurt, skur, all of these things are fermented as well. And then with the grain based, you have uh, amazaki, which is a Japanese drink made from fermented rice. Beer, everybody's favorite, of course, which is typically made from fermented grains, mostly barley and malt. Uh, all of these beverages, including sake, that are made from fermented rice. And then you have sourdough and a variety of, uh, of breads that are fermented. And then ogi, which is a fermented por porridge made from, uh, from corn, from maize, sorghum, or mie. And then, of course, wine, whiskey, and a, and a variety of other alcohols. So you look at, if you want a bit more information on like traditional preparation of grains and legumes, I recommend this Fermented Cereals, A Global Perspective. And this is the link, and you can read about that. The fermentation process itself, why do you want to do that? Well, it increases the shelf life and it avoids spoilage. And of course, it cha completely changes the flavor profile as well as the aroma. Some people argue sometimes for the worse. Um, are these the only reasons to ferment food is one of the pesky questions that a scientist could ask. And why would you ferment foods? And I'm going to be talking specifically about, you know, legumes and grains and, and maybe some dairy. So what you need to, we need to talk about first and get out of the way is plants, reproduction, and chemical warfare. Whenever I, I talk to an audience, this just seems really odd to them. But to, to a chemist, this is totally natural. Chemists have journals that are all about the isolation of products from plants and then testing of it to see if it has any activity in the body. Um, if, you know... Everybody knows that some of the world's most notorious poisons are made by plants, you know, reserpine being one of them. So it, it shouldn't be surprising to you that plants contain certain things that are good, but they contain certain things that are bad too. And that's because the plant doesn't want to be eaten. It's trying to protect itself from predation, right? It can't move, it can't run away. So how does it do that? With chemical warfare. With, you know, it creates certain compounds that have various activities against various insects and whatnot. Um, and why does it do that specifically in the seeds? There's actually, there's, I should mention, there's only one plant that wants to be eaten, and that's grass. You know, when the ruminants chew on grass or they, they cut the grass, the, the roots go deeper and deeper into the ground, and they create topsoil. So grass creates topsoil. Annual, uh, like wheat and whatnot, destroy topsoil. They deplete it and they turn, turn it into sand. So the seeds of legumes and cereals represent their reproductive future. Right? So if they're destroyed or eaten by predators, the plant can't pass its genes to the next generation. And the, pa the plant wants to pass its gene to the next generation. It wants to survive. Since plants are stationary, their evolutionary strategy to escape predation are either to evolve physical barriers like thorns, barbs, hard shells, stuff like that, or to evolve a succulent outer fruit. This is a really tricky 
uh, thing that uh, fruit trees do, right? So, oh, here's this nice fruit. I can eat it, consume the seeds, and I'll, you know, crap it out later with some, uh, some food for the seed to grow. And, and that's a win-win situation. So that's another way that you go at it. Uh, or you can involve toxic secondary compounds and provision them in seeds, roots, and leaves, you know, to protect from predation. So what is the characteristic of a successful toxic secondary compound. In order for the plant to protect itself using this strategy, what does it need? Well, that compound has to resist gut protease enzymes. You know, if it's going to, po to poison you, it has to get into you. And in order to get into you, it has to cross the GI barrier, right? It has to get into the bloodstream. So it has to survive the stomach and all of the digestive enzymes that are in the gut. It needs the ability to breach the gut cell lining, of course, um, by increasing gut permeability or dissolving gut cell membranes. It needs the ability to destroy cell membranes of uh, bacterial, fungi, and other simple cell organisms, and the ability to deliver additional toxic compounds once the cell membranes are breached. So that's how you make a successful toxin. That's how plants make successful toxins. So there are actually other ways of, uh, of doing this as well. There's uh, all kinds of activities that these things can have. This is uh, just one variety. So, gee, you know, what does fermentation do? And you know, I'm kind of giving myself away here. You're going to see a lot of things about like food science and food chemistry and, and, and whatnot come up. And I kind of read this on my spare time and I find all kinds of interesting tidbits of information. There's a little bit of feedback in the mic. Um, but moderate decrease in pH by sourdough fermentation is sufficient to reduce phytate content of whole wheat flour through endogenous phytase activities. Like, wow, there's a lot of thing going on here. What the heck is a phytate? What's a pH? pH is a measure of the acidity, right? Anything that's below 7 is slightly acidic, uh, is getting more and more acidic. Everything that's above 7 is getting more and more basic. And then the extreme are 0 to 14. 14 being extremely basic zero or one being extremely acidic. So whole wheat bread, you, you know, you read the abstract, this caught my attention, you read the abstract, and it says whole wheat bread is an important source of, min of minerals, but also contains considerable amounts of phytic acid, which is known to impair their absorption. Hey, that's interesting, I, I didn't know that. Nobody told me that. I was told to eat whole wheat bread. Nobody told me there was phytic acid in there that prevented me from absorbing the nutrients, right? But it turns out that the uh, bacteria that is naturally present on the grains is going to give you an acidic environment that is going to neutralize this phytic acid and increase the availability of the nutrients that are in the grains. Hi, that's pretty interesting. And there's another article here. So lactic acid fermentation and cereal flours resulted in a 100% for rye, 95 to 100% for wheat, 34 to 40% for oat. Notice that it's not always 100% reduction in phytate content within 24 hours. The, the extent of phytate degradation was shown to be independent from the lactic acid bacteria strain used for fermentation. However, phytate degradation during cereal dough fermentation was positively correlated with endogenous, endogenous plant phytase activity and heat inactivation of the endogenous cereal phytase prior to lactic acid fermentation. So they're essentially saying, listen, as long as there's some kind of bacteria in there that's going to lower the pH, that's going to allow this one enzyme that's in the grain called phytase to destroy some of the phytic acid. The, the, the phytase is really activated at this particular pH, destroys the phytic acid, increases the bioavailability of the minerals that are in the grains. That's really nice. Well, how many of you eat fermented grains? Yeah. We're not told to eat fermented grains. We eat unprocessed grains or highly processed grains. No, they're just milled nowadays. Someone's taken a shortcut, right? Why are they taking the shortcut? Well, a fermentation process is an extra cost. So having us eat food that hasn't been fermented is uh, you know, taking the cost and putting it on our backs. Influence of germination and fermentation on bioaccessibility of zinc and iron from food grains. Again, you know, this fermentation is increasing the bioavailability of the nutrients, mostly minerals from the grain, and in this case, zinc and iron. And then phytic acid degradation in complementary foods using phytase naturally occurring in whole grain cereals. And this one, actually, they're pairing legumes and grains uh, in order to, uh, to get what's called like a 
complementary or a balanced amino acid profile. You might hear people say, oh, you know, if you have legumes with, uh, with corn, that's a balanced protein. So what they mean by that is that they're getting a more complete amino acid profile. Nevertheless, if you compare the amino acid profile to that of meat, it's not the same. So there's certain amino acids that are much higher in meat uh, that are not necessarily as elevated in this quote-unquote complete protein. Uh, but this combination is, is really great for fermentation. So let's, you know, let's see what we can dig up on phytic acid. What is this phytic acid? What does it do? So if you take phytic acid and you add it to white bread, it inhibits fractional apparent magnesium absorption in humans. So well, that's increasing. That's interesting. Phytic acid has been reported to impair the absorption of minerals and trace elements such as calcium, zinc, and iron in humans. Okay, so we have calcium, zinc, iron, and magnesium. Everybody, everybody familiar with those four metals? Calcium, zinc, iron, and magnesium. Yeah, how many North Americans are deficient in calcium, zinc, iron, and magnesium? Right, almost freaking everybody. Could it be, is it possible that it's because we're eating all this whole wheat bread? It turns out that the phytic acid is really concentrated in the bran. Bioavailability of iron from uh, cereal-based weeding foods. I like to give the original abstracts, but unfortunately we didn't have a subscription to the Bulletin of the Chemical Society of Ethiopia, so you'll, you'll have to trust me that this is accurate. Uh, so contents in different weaning foods. The weaning foods tested may not be, oh, what is this? There was a strong inverse correlation between available iron and phytate contents in different weaning foods. The weaning food tested may not be regarded as useful sources of bioavailable iron for rapidly growing infants when fed as gruel or porridge. Substantial improvement in iron availability due to fermentation may be of practical nutritional importance. You think? Like, these are kids. Like, this is stuff that, you know, porridge and gruel that we feed to kids. It's like, yeah, we, they, they probably need the iron. They probably need to grow. I mean, if you look at societies that eat a lot of unfermented grains and legumes, they have stunted growth. They're short. They're really, really short. There's a genetic factor there, but it's not entirely genetic. And some of that has to do with the absorption of these important minerals. Iron and calcium availability from digestion of sil uh, from infant cereals. So again, dephytonization, elimination of phytic acid, uh, increased iron and calcium availability compared to the same infant cereals reconstituted with the follow-on formula. Phytic acid and trace elements. So studies in animals and human subjects have shown that diets high in phytic acid can cause zinc deficiency and that the phytate content is negatively correlated to zinc absorption. Some optimal zinc status has been shown to cause increased morbidity, poor pregnancy outcome, impaired growth, immune, comp immune competence and cognitive function, emphasizing the need to optimize zinc biofilability. The good news is that phytic acid does not inhibit copper absorption, but has a modest inhibitory effect on manganese. So you can add manganese to the list as well as iron, calcium, magnesium, and zinc. So this stuff is not good news. And then, of course, it's iron absorption in man, ascorbic acid and dose-dependent inhibition of phytate. And this is something that you know, people are always going to bring up. Oh, but if you eat a lot of vitamin C, you know, it's going to inhibit the, the phytic acid a little bit. But if you look at the doses that they use in this study, it's really not something that you want to do. Uh, you know, it, you'd be much better off, and we'll see there's other reasons to, that you, you would want to have. It would be preferable to consume a fermented product as opposed to an unfermented product. So, yeah, sure, you know, a little bit of vitamin C is going to inhibit the stuff, but it's not all that great. So, is there anything else that this phytic acid does aside from, uh, you know, the, uh, the mineral, reducing the bioavailability of minerals in food? And so you find this paper, Inhibition of Trypsin Activity in Vitro by Phytate. So phytates or salts of phytic acid, uh, this... For those of you who are chemists, you know, this whole thing means something. Here's an interesting myoinositol 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 hexakis dihydrogen phosphate. That is actually something. It, it means something to us. Um, have long been recognized as components of certain seeds and plant tissues, especially cereal grains and oil seeds. It has been appreciated for some time that if phytate compromises a substantial part of the diet, they can interfere with the bioavailability of elements such as zinc, calcium, magnesium, etc. There has been a renewed and substantial interest in it. Well, let's see. Although less attention has been placed on phytate protein interaction, it has been reported that phytic acid can inhibit pepsin, which is an enzyme that helps digest protein activity, and alpha amylase, an enzyme that helps digest carbohydrate activity in vitro, uh, as well as, as trypsin and chymotrypsin. So these things, 
inhibit the, the enzymes that you have in your gut that allow you to digest protein and allow you to digest carbohydrate. So, you know, most people at this point are like, oh, okay, you know, the whole, uh, the whole fermentation thing and, and, and the, the bioavailability of minerals I can understand, but do I really care about the protein and the carbohydrate? Well, we'll see. So, of course, the effect of natural fermentation on protein fractions and in vitro protein digestibility of rice. So fermentation of rice improves the availability of protein. Fermentation of mie, I think, or sorghum, also improves the protein availability. Uh, and then here we have uh, fermentation uh, improves the starch and protein digestibility in pearl mie. That's the one I was looking for. You also have one in sorghum. This is an interesting one. Let's see, trypsin inhibitory activity was reduced by 58%, 43%, and 31% in Hamra, Sala, and Bada, respectively, whereas amylase inhibitory activity was reduced by 74%. So you, you see, it's not 100%. Like, it's an improvement, but most of the time it's not, not 100%, but it's better. And, the, you know, cultures have figured this out over time that, that this is a little better, yeah. Right. Yeah, polished white rice. That's right. So if you take rice, you remove the bran, and uh, you, you get white rice, that's mostly starch, and a lot of the anti-nutrients have been uh, eliminated. So the, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you should eat brine rice. It's healthier. And I tell you, no, you should eat white rice. Because you hear those arguments where, you know, um, in cultures, rice uh, carbohydrate consumption is high, but it's, it's supposed to, I guess, be the brine rice. That's right. And so... It, the rice consumption is high in uh, in Asian cultures, but as we'll see, like rice is one of the less problematic grains, and it also is highly refined. Like they, they eliminate the brand, and, and the, those cultures, like we have plenty of postdocs in lab that are Asian. I ask them, do you guys eat brown rice? And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like the the more refined, the better. The sweeter, the better. This is what they say. So you know. Okay, what do I care if the carbohydrate or the protein isn't fully digested? You know, can't I just eat more carbohydrate and protein to make up for the stuff that wasn't digested? Well, here's why uh, you, should, uh, you should care. So what you need to know is that the gut is an organ of immunology. It is highly, highly involved in immune responses. So our gut encounters foreign proteins and other substances every time we eat. And then there's immune soldiers that sit under the enterocytes and they're ready to pounce and call in on reinforcements on anything that's foreign. But our immune system is typically not incited by dietary proteins because our gastrointestinal system usually breaks them down into standard amino acids before they can encounter our defenses and trigger a response. So most dietary proteins don't aggravate the gut, don't activate the gut immune system or the, the immune response because they, get, they don't get there undigested. There's a little bit of, uh, of literature here as far as the gut as an organ of immunology is concerned, and you can uh, read that if you want. So the, the question is, well, can peptides reach the gut intact? And this is where we start talking about gluten. So gluten is composed of two proteins, gliadin and glutenin, and it's found in large quantities in wheat, rye, barley, smaller quantities in oats. The gluten in Corn and rice lacks gliadin, so it tends to be a little less problematic. Virtually all grains contain storage proteins that are called prolamines that are part of the same family of gluten and have a high proline content. So gliadin uh, is in wheat, avenin is in oats, secolin is in rye, hordein is in, barley, in barley, zein is in corn. And then gluten has a peculiar structure. It is unusually rich in the amino acids glutamine and proline. And as we'll see, proline is the problematic one here. And if you're a chemist or biochemist, you know that incorporation of a lot of protein, a lot of proline amino acid in a protein gives it a specific beta turn. And it makes it hard for our uh, chopping machinery, like protein chopping machinery, to, to get at the bond. And so grains and legumes, as we mentioned, contain you know, protease inhibitors. So you've got this combination of protease inhibitors, really hard uh, proteins to digest, which you know, means that it's very likely that these things are going to get to the gut. And here's, you, you can uh, read this, it's actually really interesting. It has to do with the celiac sprue and the, uh, the proteolytic resistance of certain uh, peptides and proteins that are in gluten. 
And what they find is that if they treat those things with something called prolyl endopeptidase, this is something that is going to help break all of those bonds, all those uh, um, proteolytic bonds that are made to proline, then this thing is no longer uh, allergenic for people who have celiac disease. So we know that this is the problematic part. So now, does it really matter if undigested undigested proteins get into the gut? It certainly matters for people who have celiac disease. For those of you who are not familiar with celiac disease, it's an autoimmune disease where the immune system attacks the gut lining. This is essentially a normal intestinal lining, and this is the lining of a person with celiac disease. You can tell that it's been carpet bombed, right? It's flattened. And uh, absorption of, of nutrients is highly compromised by the fact that the villi are damaged. The villi and micro uh, villi are damaged. So what happens in celiac disease? What's going on here? So you have gluten or gliadin that makes its way to the gut undigested. It makes its way to the gut undigested or partially digested, I should say. It, it is somewhat cut up, but there's still fairly long peptides in there. And it binds to a receptor on the enterocyte, which increases or dissolves tight junctions and allow things to get th straight through. So it completely bypasses the whole lymph system and the, uh, and the blood vessels. It just gets straight through underneath where the immune system uh, lies. So these gluten fragments cross the intestinal lining in abundance and they accumulate under the epithelial cells the gluten induces enterocytes to secrete interleukin-15, and this is an inflammatory compound, which arouses immune cells called intraepithelial lymphocytes against enterocytes. So it's like, you know, the, the immune system's getting pissed off. It's like, hey, you know, it's trying to tell the, the, the gut cells, why are you letting this stuff in? I, I don't want that in there. And it starts to attack the cells. But it gets a little bit worse the gluten actually intermingles with something called transglutaminase. When the enterocytes are being attacked, they try to repair themselves by secreting an enzyme called transglutaminase. And that enzyme interacts with the gluten to make some hybrid. And that hybrid is detected by the immune system, by things that are called antigen-presenting cells of the immune system. They join with the modified gluten to HLA molecules and they display the resulting complexes to other immune cells. So essentially what's going on is you have this chimeric structure that's got transglutaminase to it, which is part of your body, an enzyme that's part of your body. It, transglutaminase is, is in every, almost every cell. Uh, and it's also, so it's transglut transglutaminase plus gluten. And then part of the immune system grabs that and it brings it to the head honcho and it says, hey, this is a problem you need to go attack this right now. And that's what happens. There's an immune response that gets set up, and it gets specifically set up to this transglutaminase gluten hybrid because people who have celiac disease are wired up genetically. They have this HLA-DQ2 and HLA-DQ8. These are genes that are coding for these molecules that recognize this stuff, right? You can have all kinds of these, all kinds of recognitions, it doesn't really matter, but the people who have celiac disease, they have this one going on. This now, the helper T cells that recognize the complexes secrete molecules that attack other immune cells and can directly damage enterocytes. The helper T cells spur killer T cells to directly attack the enterocytes. Those are the cells of the, uh, of the lining, of the gut lining. And then there's also the beta cells that release antibody molecules targeted directly to gluten and to transglutaminase. So there's this huge immu immunological response that essentially telling your immune system to attack something that's now part of your body. It's a, not only attacking the enterocytes because they're seen as the source of this transglutaminase, but anything else that comes through the gut, any protein that, that comes through the gut because now the the, um, the tight junctions are dissolved, is going to get possibly recognized by the immune system as foreign and attacked. And the problem is that you know, there's various proteins in your body that might have a similar amino acid uh, content or similar amino acid sequence, and this is going to trigger an autoimmune disease. So your body starts to attack itself. What's really interesting is that this gluten stimulates the production of zonulin 
Zonulin binds to receptor called CXCR3. That dissolves the tight junctions and it increases gut permeability. And it turns out that this happens whether or not you have celiac. So the gut permeability is increased whether or not you have celiac. The only difference is whether or not there is an immune response to the enterocytes in the, in the gut cell lining. So you have to ask this question, gee, you know, is, is this a really bad thing, this increase, uh, this dissolving of the tight junction and this increasing in the leaky gut? So you start doing some research and you find, gee, okay, well, tight junctions, intestinal permeability, and autoimmunity, mm, that doesn't sound too good. So there's growing evidence that increased intestinal permeability plays a pathogenic role in various autoimmune diseases, including celiac disease and type 1 diabetes. Therefore, we hypothesize that besides genetic and environmental factors, loss of intestinal barrier function is necessary to develop autoimmunity. In this review, each of these components will be briefly reviewed. So yeah, I mean, this is bad news, and it's bad news for autoimmune diseases. And you look at populations that don't consume any of these foods, and they don't have these autoimmune diseases. So of course, you look at the autoimmune disease etiology, and you find you know, such things as infection, geography, because of vitamin D, physical trauma, vaccinations. These are all factors in autoimmune diseases. I'm not saying this is the only factor in autoimmune disease, but the leaky gut and any factor that increases intestinal permeability is in there. And if you look at a, like a list of autoimmune disease, you find that all of these autoimmune diseases present with a leaky gut. So let's look at the list. Allergies, ankylosing spondylitis. This is a type of arthritis that targets the sacroiliac joint in the bottom of the spine. Asthma, autism, autoimmune gastritis, autoimmune hepatitis, celiac disease, chronic fatigue syndrome, Crohn's disease, depression, dermatitis, type 1 diabetes, eczema, gut migraine, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, juvenile arthritis, lupus, multiple sclerosis, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, schizophrenia, scleroderma, ulcerative colitis, just to name a few. About 30% of autoimmune diseases, of, the, of those that have been tested, present with a leaky gut. That's a pretty good association, right? It doesn't mean it's causation, but it's a pretty good correlation. And there is a mechanism that is known for how that actually can cause an autoimmune response. So is there something else in those grains that could possibly be problematic? Is there something else that this fermentation process is doing that is beneficial? You know, so this is just me like asking more questions like, gee, okay, so it eliminates the phytase. Is there any other problematic compound that, that could be present in those things? And so you do a little bit more digging and you find that the effect of natural fermentation on the lectin of lentils measured by immunological methods, huh? The result confirmed those obtained by ELISA and indicated that the lectin almost disappeared after 72 hours. What the heck is a lectin, right? So you start doing a little bit of research and you find that uh, lectins, which were originally defined as something that has the ability to clump red blood cells, is actually something that now has the abil uh, ability to reversibly bind a specific mono or oligosaccharide. So it's like some protein, some glycoprotein that has the ability to bind a sugar. And what's interesting is that the way that a virus infects a cell is that it recognizes a specific carbohydrate on the cell surface and allows that as a way of entry into the cell. And these things are, they are using a very similar mechanism to that. Lectins are omnipresent in the plant kingdom. That is very important. Some people will say, oh, grains and legumes are bad because they contain lectins. You know what? All plants contain lectins. But grains and legumes tend to be problematic because the lectins that they contain bind to the gut tissue. That's why they're problematic. So what, uh, what are some lectins and where can we find them? Wheat germ has a wheat germ agglutinin, WGA. Wheat flour will contain some wheat germ agglutinin. White flour, like, like I said earlier, I'd rather eat white bread than, uh, than a whole wheat bread. White flour has a whole lot less because the germ is gone. Kidney beans and other beans, soybeans, tomatoes, and peanuts, all of these contain lectins that have been identified. And not only have they been identified, they've been shown to cross uh, the gut barrier and, enter, and uh, enter the bloodstream fairly rapidly. And this is uh, an example here with the peanut lectin, PNA. I think they tested seven subjects, and they see that it enters the bloodstream in all subjects, some of them a little later. I guess number seven here is a little lucky. There's not a whole lot that's in the bloodstream. 
So here's tomato lectin, peanut, legume, weed germ. Uh, most have been shown in animals to enter the bloodstream as well as in humans. The uh, research on this is still ongoing, so the mechanisms of entry are not always known. Like, how do these things cross the, the gut barrier? How do they get into the bloodstream? And there's three hypotheses there. One of them is that they're going through the M cells. The other one is that they're doing something that's very analogous to gliadin. And then the other one is that they're using something called the uh, EGF re receptor. That's just details for people who want to know a little bit more about this stuff. So how bad are these lectins? I like this paper. It was taken out of toxicology and applied pharmacology. So they're saying, yeah, you know, we germ agglutinin. glutenin. It's a plant protein. It binds specifically to sugars expressed, among many others, by human gastrointestinal epithelial and immune cells, right? So I'm not making this stuff up. This is known. We germ agglutinin is a toxic compound and is an anti-nutrient factor. So this is the first time I saw this, this word, anti-nutrient, and is widely used now, the anti-nutrients in grains. But recent works have shown that it may have potential as an anti-tumor drug. So these people are like, hey, yeah, you know, it has some nasty effects, but it might be, might be good as an anti-tumor drug. So they started looking at the properties a little bit more to figure out whether or not they could use it. And if you look at, the, at what they found out, they're like, well, you know, here we show that at nanomolar concentrations, this is really low, this is 10 to the minus 9. Uh, nanomolar concentrations, wheat germaglutinin is unexpectedly bioactive on immune cells. The supernatants of wheat germaglutinin stimulated peripheral blood mononuclear cells and altered the integrity of the epithel epithelium layer when administered to the basolateral side of differential CACO cells. This is not important. And effects can be partially inhibited by monoclonal antibodies. At nanomolar concentrations, WGA stimulates the synthesis of pro-inflammatory pro, pro cytokines, and thus the biological activity of WGA should be reconsidered by taking into account the effects of WGA on the immune system and the gastrointestinal interface. These results shed new light onto the molecular mechanisms underlying the onset of gastrointestinal disorders observed in vivo upon di dietary intake of wheat-based foods. So they're like, wow, I mean, this is so bad for the immune system, we just cannot use this as a drug. But, hey, look, on, on the bright side, we actually discovered why these things are so problematic. Like, they admit, right, the onset of gastrointestinal disorders observed in vitro upon dietary intake of wheat-based foods. Like, wheat-based foods are known to be problematic. No. No. I'm not sure if I'm going to repeat that for the people online. Um, it's just getting through and really activating the immune system in a bad way, causing inflammation, is what, is what this is saying, essentially, and, and causing problems for people who have gastrointestinal disorders. Because one of the payoffs of dropping out lectins is better cellular communication. Is that it's not about cellular communication. It's about reducing... Uh, the, the leaky gut syndrome and reducing inflammation that is caused by the lectins. These things happen to be involved in another autoimmune disease, which is rheumatoid arthritis, a modulation of immune function by dietary lectins and rheumatoid arthritis. And something really interesting, uh, concannavalin A and weed germaglutinin direct interactions with insulin receptors. These things bind to insulin receptors. That's really interesting. If you have something bound to the insulin receptor and the insulin can't get to it, it's called like an antagonist. And that, in a way, induces insulin resistance because insulin can't get in there and do its job. Not only does it bind to the insulin receptor, it also binds to the leptin receptor. So, you know, remember leptin, right, is this hormone that controls energy expenditure and appetite. So this is really bad news. Do dietary lectins cause disease? This is a really interesting paper that came out in the British Journal of Medicine. And it's essentially a hospital that launched a healthy eating day. Uh, one of the dishes contained red kidney beans. Vomited in theater. Customers suffer, suffered profuse vomiting, some with diarrhea. 
And it turns out because these things weren't sufficiently cooked and weren't prepared or soaked and prepared properly, people got really sick. So again, you know, these are really bad for causing various gastrointestinal problems. And the doc goes on to say, you know, here's why they're toxic. They're inflammatory. They're resistant to cooking and digestive enzymes, and they're present in, in much of our food unless you do a, a heck of a lot of fermentation. So a, prelim, a preliminary study on the effect of germination on saponin. And so this is, again, are there other things in there that this germination or fermentation is getting rid of? And then you come up on saponin. Well, gee, what is a saponin? So the, the name is derived from soap, and it's a steroid or a tritorpinoid glycoside. Uh, they're widely distributed throughout the plant kingdom, including many cultivated crops and solanaceous plants. So has anybody heard the term nightshade? Those are the solanaceous plants. So you've got white potatoes, all varieties of peppers, tomatoes, and eggplants, right? Those are your, your nightshades. So their primary function is to protect the plant from microbial and insect attack. But they dissolve cell membranes. And in mammals, they produce pores in the gut lining and increase intestinal permeability. Oh, all right. How does that happen? So you have your, you have your gut lining here, and this is your saponin, and it inserts wherever it sees cholesterol. And if you get enough of these inserting, it's essentially going to cause the surface to bulge, and eventually it's going to take a chunk out of your intestine and create holes and increase intestinal permeability. These things happen to be really problematic when they're combined with lectins. So you have saponins that are known. There's alpha tomatine in plants, alpha solanine in chackanine in potatoes, soy saponin, elogic saponin. And it's used as an emulsifying agent. You find it a lot in sodas and junk food. In fact, root beer has the highest legal concentration of quilaja available in it. Uh, and then alfalfa sprouts, of course, and then soybeans, particularly problematic because they have the combination of lectin and saponin. So they've got the dual dose thing going on. So how much saponin is in potatoes? Well, it turns out that most of the saponin's in the skin. So if you want to eat potatoes, just peel the darn things, right? Potatoes are a good source of protein and starch, but if you're going to eat them, I'd probably recommend that you peel them. Here's an article about potato glycogen glycoalkaloids and their adverse effects on intestinal permeability, if you're interested. The tomatoes, they're mostly found in green tomatoes. When you get to ripe tomatoes and whatnot, the levels are pretty low. So, you know, if you're eating uh, red tomatoes, not too much of a problem from the saponin content. The, the lectin content isn't all that high either. The soybeans, however, they've got a lot. So soy protein, isolate, textured, uh, even tempeh, which is fermented, still has a lot, tofu and whatnot have quite a bit of saponin, and that's in combination with the lectin that's already there, so that's particularly problematic. And then all legumes have some of this stuff. Peanuts are kind of low, but peanuts have the lectin too that is really problematic, and of course everybody knows peanut allergies are common. There's a couple of other fr uh, foods. We're going to get into alfalfa sprouts and amaranth seeds. These are things that I like to call pseudo cereals. So, so grains and cereals are the seeds of grasses whereas pseudo-cereals are the seeds of broadleaf plants, and they uh, in include quite a bit of stuff. And there's, of course, uh, quinoa seeds and quilaja extract that I've already talked about that still have a significant um, dose of these saponins. And like I mentioned, 100 is the U.S. maximum concentration permitted in, in, mac in, in foods of this quilaja extract, and you find that in root beer. If you have someone that's got autoimmune disease, you might want to recommend that they eliminate all of these foods from their diet. So, you know, grains, legumes, whatnot. Uh, nightshades, I would also recommend. For people who don't have autoimmune disease, you know, take the nightshades out for a month, reintroduce them, you see a difference, no, then just run with it and eat it. You know, no problem, you're fine. Don't need to worry about it. You've got someone who's getting really, really bad on the autoimmune disease side, I would recommend taking all the stuff out you might also have them try uh, taking out eggs because of this enzyme called lysozyme that is problematic. Milk, because of casein and beta cellulene, uh, we'll, get, uh, we'll talk about casein a little bit more. And then carrageenan, which is just like some additive that's added in a bunch of foods that you want to be uh, really careful with. 
So what are other things that increase intestinal permeability? So we've talked about the prolamine proteins, we've talked about the lectins, we've talked about the saponins. Uh, you know, the, here is the peppers, the capsaicin-containing peppers. That They're a nightshade, and capsaicin is the stuff that makes peppers hot. So you've got someone who has autoimmune issues, you might want to tell them to lay off the hot peppers. They may even want to lay off all of peppers. Alcohol increases intestinal uh, permeability, and so does NSAIDs. Aspirin, ibuprofen, and naproxen. Certain oral contraceptives, antacids that contain uh, aluminum hydroxide and not calcium carbonate or calcium hydroxide. And then certain factors causing E. coli and gram-negative overgrowth in the gut. So now people will say, okay, well, you talked about fermentation, and, you know, the fermentation process isn't perfect, but it certainly improves these foods, which generally would not be a, a really good source of, the, of nutrients. What about the process of, let's say, soaking and nixtamalization, which is like soaking basic solution and whatnot, or, you know, even the process of, of sprouting? And it turns out that they, there's a, like a slight reduction in anti-nutrients, but a, an incomplete reduction in anti-nutrients. And it's, it's child's play compared to the advantages that you get from fermentation. So it's just not enough. Whether it's soaking or germination, as far as the phytase activity and content is concerned, it's not enough. Soaking and cooking on the saponin content, not enough. And then uh, this is one that I already showed for the, uh, the germination and saponin. Again, it doesn't eliminate the these uh, anti-nutrients to a significant extent. So, you know, it becomes fairly obvious that, okay, well, these fermented grains and legumes, they're not, grains and legumes in general are not ideal as far as nutrition is concerned. Maybe the fermented stuff is a little better. It's really hard to access. If you want it, you have to make it on your own. So what am I going to recommend at the end of the day, right? I'm going to recommend that you take this stuff out of your diet. And that's where people freaking lose it. They're like, oh, my God, I have to eat bread. Or, you know, I have to eat this and I have to eat that. And they come up with a bunch of excuses. Well, you know, they say, hey, our grains are a really good source of uh, B vitamins. First and foremost, they're reinforced with B vitamins, not necessarily a good source of B vitamins. But if you compare them to, let's say, meat or fruit, and vegetables, the fruit and veggies win almost every time, except for the niacin, maybe, that had, the meat has plenty of niacin. The only time I think that the, uh, the, the grains win is they, they win over meat when it comes to folate content. But if you're really looking for all of the B vitamins and whatnot, the fruit and veggies and meat are, are the place to be. Grains are a poor source of that, a really poor source of that. So you're like, oh, uh, all right, well... What about other things, you know, vitamins, uh, B12, the vitamins we've already covered? What about phosphorus or vitamin C and iron? And if you compare the whole grains to whole meal, fruit, vegetables, seafood, lean meats, nuts and seeds, you're going to find that one of these foods is better than the whole grains in a specific category. So, in other words, there's no good reason to eat that stuff when it comes to nutrient density. There's plenty of other more nutrient-rich foods to eat that aren't problematic. When it comes to branched-chain amino acids, people familiar with branched-chain amino acids, if you look at the makeup of muscle, about a third of the amino acids in muscle are branched-chain amino acids, so they're disproportionately represented in muscle. And people who are trying to build muscle mass eat branched-chain amino acids. So if you look at branched-chain amino acids, you know, maybe aside from soy protein, the grains are, are pretty low on the list. Of course, you know, I, I wouldn't expect fruits and starchy vegetables to be high, but the grains are certainly not a good source of branched-chain amino acids. And then the best one is, well, what about fiber? Oh, the fiber. Well, here's refined cereals, here's whole grain cereals, here's fruit, and here's non-starchy vegetables. Now, there's a difference in the fiber, but you want fiber, non-starchy vegetables, and fruits are the way to go. Whole grains are not that good of a source of fiber. And then when it comes to fiber, there's two types. There's soluble fiber, and there's insoluble fiber. The soluble fiber, which you find mostly in vegetables and fruits, tubers, roots and bulbs, nuts and seeds, there is some in psyllium husk. Yes, I know. Uh, but these are great sources of soluble fiber. That reaches the gut, and there are bacteria in your gut that will ferment that into short-chain fatty acids, propionic acid and butyric acid. The cells of your gut are then going to use those short-chain fatty acids to heal their membranes and essentially heal the gut. 
they also uh, they have an anti-inflammatory action upon the bowel and improve conditions such as irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and colostridium difficile. And they upregulate mineral transporting genes and their membrane transport proteins within cells of the colon walls, and this results in improved calcium, magnesium, and iron absorption. So this is good th stuff. But insoluble fiber, unfortunately, does not dissolve in water, can't be processed by the host cells of the gut. So this actually does mechanical damage. It's insoluble, it goes through the gut, it damages the gut lining, and as a response, the gut lining secretes a mucus-type uh, substance in order to get rid of the stuff as fast as possible. And people tell you, oh, fiber is good because you know, it increases the rate of passage of stuff through the, uh, through the intestine. Yeah, because it's trying to get rid of it because it's hurting it. That's why. <laughs> That's why it's doing that. So other people will tell you, well, you know, it increases stool bulk and softness alongside you know, your toilet paper bill is my response to that. Like, just, I really don't care about the stool bulk and softness uh, if it's going to do a damage. So whole grains, you know, you want to find bran as an excellent source of insoluble fiber. And this is a scenario that you might find yourself in if you eat a lot of that stuff. As far as the soluble fiber is concerned and the gut healing process, it turns out that if your gut is in good shape, that itself might be enough to lose weight. Supplementation of, uh, of soluble fiber, in this case oligofructose, increased peptide YY. Now remember, this is something that, suppress that suppresses appetite uh, in overweight and obese adults and makes them lose weight, which is fairly interesting. And you get plenty of soluble fiber from fruits and vegetables. This is a little bit of a primer on prebiotics. This soluble fiber is often referred to as prebiotics. You're going to hear that word a lot. And then as if that wasn't enough to, compete, to, to convince people to lay off the crack and get rid of the, the grains and the wheat, I'm like, well, you know, if it's really that heart healthy, can you explain to me why 31% of the mummies that have been tested, so you know, Egyptians were uh, huge wheat farmers, why 31% of them had uh, atherosclerosis? So this is a, a group that tested mummies, looked at the, uh, the calcium via tomography, and they determined that about 31% of Egyptians had atherosclerosis. So this whole notion of whole grains being heart healthy only comes from the fact that they slightly lower cholesterol, but isn't based in reality. I mean, not at all. Yes. That's right. So the, the question is, or the comment is that, you know, fiber in the food isn't necessarily because fiber is beneficial, but it has other effects. And I mentioned earlier that fiber slows down gastric emptying and also uh, slows down the absorption of various carbohydrates from the gut. And that's another, uh, like, like, that's one of the positive effects it could be having. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to a diet that's got like no fiber very shortly. So it's not, this stuff is not necessary.